keep a I keep a, uh, a calendar or schedule whatnot of every every sermon I've ever preached here I have a record of the date the title and whether I preached it in the morning or the night and so I realized or I got to thinking while I was getting ready for tonight about how long it had been since we had this format with our Sunday night live q and a it's been three months, three months since we've had this format, and I just started going back and looking at things between, uh, for example, between uh, me going on vacation in August, right after the very last one, had two or three meetings, polishing the pulpit, uh, um, special Sunday night services with Hamilton out at Maywood. I mean, there's just there's just been so many different things that have that are they're good things. I mean, good things have been going on. But I just couldn't believe it. it's been it's been three months since we've had this format, and so uh, and so I'm I'm glad to be back in the, for lack of a better term in Sunday night teaching mode, and um, uh, and I've got I've had some questions that have come in. Uh, I don't know I know a lot of you are not on social media, but uh, uh, house to house, heart to heart asked me to expand my role a little bit with them. Uh, back in the summer, and they've asked me to make three one-minute videos every week. And usually it's three, sometimes it's four. And some of you have probably seen those videos. It's called the one-minute Bible study. Uh, let me just tell you, for a preacher, it's hard to say anything in 60 seconds and, and, and try to answer a question. But uh, we get over probably over a thousand views on every single video every single week so it's a, it's a great it's a great work and so i've had a number of questions that have come in through through that method or that uh, uh, mode and so i thought well i'll just deal with some of these in this in this setting uh in a in a greater you know deal with, obviously in a lot greater detail uh, uh with respect to that um I'll tell you though, before I start, I'm, I'm looking around. I, I think everybody was here. We don't have anybody here tonight that needs to take Lord's Supper, do we? Okay, I, I didn't think so, but I wanted to make sure. That, like I said, it's been so long since I've done this, I don't even remember what the proper order is. And so, but, uh, uh, but uh, the, I had some questions come in. Uh, actually, I had a question come in, and I really should have dealt with this first, uh, that... The question was, does God hear the prayer of sinners? Well, when I answered that question, it actually took me three videos to answer in a very brief way to answer that question. And then the answers to those in those videos brought out more questions. And so I thought the easiest thing to, the easiest thing to do is just look at some matters pertaining to the sinner's prayer. And, uh, and answer a lot of maybe answer a lot of different questions at, at one time. Uh, but you know with regard to the idea of answering, does God answer or hear the prayer of sinners? Let me just go ahead and off the top of my head deal with that briefly. I dealt, I dealt with that, uh, that question in, in two initial segments. And the first is we have to define terms because if we don't if we're not saying the same, if we're not thinking the same thing when we're using the same words, we're talking past one another. And so the first thing that has to be understood is, uh, is what do we mean by the term sinner? You know, what do we mean? Does God hear the prayer of sinners? All right, so what do we mean by sinner? Well, one thing that we might think about is that all of us are sinners. In that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. There's none that does good and does not sin. Uh, there's not a just person on earth. Ecclesiastes 7, 20. And Paul quoted that text in, uh, in Romans 3, 9 and 10. So there's a sense in which we're all sinners in the fact that we've all sinned. But in the New Testament, when we find the term sinners being used, it's not talking about simply a, a person, as a, as a general rule, it's not talking about people who have sinned in, as, as a matter of, of universality. Uh, 
To use it in, in that sense, Paul said, uh, he said uh, that Christ came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 13. Paul uses the term sinners to speak of everybody in the world that is of accountable age that has obviously has at some point committed a sin. But as a general rule, when the New Testament uses the word sinners, it's talking about people who are outside of a covenant relationship with God or people who have abandoned a covenant relationship with God. Uh, uh, for example, um, in, uh, in John chapter 9, the, the blind man who was healed in John 9, in the first part of that, of that uh, chapter, uh, as, as, as that story continues to unfold, um, uh, the, the Jewish leadership referred to Jesus as a sinner. You remember the Pharisee talked about the woman washing, washing Jesus' feet. If he knew, if he was a prophet, he wouldn't let this woman wash his feet because that woman is a sinner. And that's talking about, that's talking about someone who is, is living outside of a proper relationship with God. And in, the core, in that discourse in John 9, the, the Pharisee said of Jesus, which is to me one of the most out, outlandish statements ever found anywhere in the Scriptures. Here's what they said of Jesus. We know this man is a sinner. The only man who never, ever sinned. They said, we know he is a sinner. And here's what the blind, the formerly, the man that had been blind said. He said, said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. He said, but here's what I do know. Once I was blind, but now I see. And then later in the 31st verse of John 9, uh, the blind man said this. Now, when I call him the blind man, he's obviously the man who was healed of his blindness. He said, he says, we know God does not hear sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. And so the, even, even that man is using the term sinner in the context of a man who is outside of a, any type of a covenant relationship with God or someone who's living in open rebellion uh, to God who may be at some time been in a covenant relationship with God. And so when we say, does God hear sinners... Or we, or we would say that God does not hear sinners. We're, we're talking about people who have never had a relationship with God or people who are not living in accordance with the, the covenant that they've made. So a non-Christian is a sinner. No, no, a person who's never been a Christian in today's age, a person who has never been a Christian is a sinner. But also a Christian who is living in rebellion to the will of God, is also a sinner. Not, not the Christian who sins, not the Christian who, who at some point in time inadvertently, you know, without any forethought, commits a sin, because that's all of us. That's 1 John 1, 7. The blood of Christ, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. We sin even while we walk in the light. All of us. But that doesn't make us sinners in that broad, or in that broad uh, category of sinners. But a Christian who's not living right would be a sinner. In other words, a Christian who is not making, who is not making a, an effort to live in accordance with the will of God would be a sinner. Um, you know... Uh, you know, we all know, we all know people, we all know people who claim to be members of the body of Christ who are not living the way that the Bible would have them to live. And yet, in the midst, in the midst of some type of immediate crisis, is going to do what? They're going to ask for prayers or they're going to pray or whatever. Now, the best thing for them to do is ask somebody else to pray. Because the blind man was right. God does not hear sinners. Does not hear sinners. In Proverbs 28 verse 9 it says, uh, Whoever, whosoever turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Proverbs 28 9. 
And so, but we know Christians who will turn and, and try to pray. You know, they, they've, they've lived for the devil for, for weeks or months or years. And in a moment of crisis, think that they're going to pray to God and God's going to hear their prayer. When, at, when we all know, when that crisis is over, what are they going to do? They're going to go right back to doing what, what they've always done. And so in that sense, God does not hear sinners. The second thing that would arise out of that is an understanding of the word hear. What do, you know, what do we mean by does God hear sinners? Well, we commonly use the term hear in at least two different ways. First and, and most generally, that we hear something. For example... Somebody, you know, somebody said yes this morning <laughs> in, in the morning sermon. She's sitting back there in the very back row with a cute little thing on top of her head. All right. Uh, but uh, are, are some of you, some of you may recall, and this is, if you ever, when, when Brandy and Dennis bring Carson and, and Cohen, if you ever hear me talk to Carson, I call him, I've called him this for years, Mr. whoop de doo He's Mr. whoop de doo why do you call him Mr. whoop de doo Well, how old's Carson now? He's 12. So probably close to 10 years ago, 9 or 10 years ago, I'm up here preaching. Sunday morning, man, I'm just preaching away. And I make some reference to, you know, that somebody did something. Well, kind of like what Rhonda did to me this evening, talking about making the bed. Yeah, I made the statement, I make the bed every day. And then she's going to poo-poo me making the bed every day as if I haven't done anything, all right? But here's what, here's what I said in the sermon that Rhonda would have said and probably did say. I wasn't listening that close. Whoop-de-doo. You know, somebody said they did this. Well, whoop-de-doo. I stand up and I said, well, whoop-de-doo. And Carson's sitting right there, you know, and he doesn't even have his, He's not even looking at me. You know, he's doing something, and I said, whoop-de-doo. And Carson says, whoop-de-doo. This is loud as that. Well, he's been Mr. whoop de doo all right? Now, Carson heard me say whoop de doo but was he really paying, he wasn't really paying attention to what I said. He wasn't hearing what I said. He heard a thing in that he heard what was said, but he really wasn't listening to me, right? right? Kind of like little bit back there when I said yes and she said yes. She, she heard yes, she says yes. All right, so we hear a thing. Uh, for example, there's an example in the New Testament where, where God spoke from heaven. And some people, you know, they heard it, but they didn't hear the voice. In other words, they heard something. In other words, they knew, you know, in other words, the airwaves, the airwaves hit their ears and they recognized some sound was made, but they didn't hear the voice of God. And so they heard a thing. All right, so we use here in that sense. But then there's another way that we can hear a thing. And that is that we can hear a thing with the intent to understand it and then respond in an appropriate way. All right? Uh, for example, uh, the Bible says that God will not hear our prayers if we do not respond or if we do not live in accordance with His Word. He will not hear our prayers. Now let me ask you a question. Does He hear, Does he hear the fact that we're praying? Does He hear it? Sure, he hears it, but does he hear it with an intent to do anything about it? The answer to that question is no. You know, this is you know, a great southern line. I hear you. Somebody talking to you, they're pleading some case, they're telling you some story. What do you say? You say? When you say, I hear you, you don't mean just that you hear them talking. What do you say? I'm listening to what you're saying with, an, with the intent to understand it, and if I can do something about it, I will. And so we use the term hear in a more specific sense. And that's the sense in which God does not hear sinners. Sure, God knows that they're praying. 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 3 verse 12 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding both the good and the evil. So we know God knows everything that goes on on the earth. So He hears the prayer. But He doesn't hear it or listen to it with the intent to do anything about it. It'd be like, it's the difference, you know, it's the difference in your kid tormenting you at the Walmart checkout line 
and somebody else's kid tormenting their parent at the Walmart checkout line. You, you, hear, you, know, you hear some other kid pleading for gum or candy or potato chips or whatever. You hear it, right? And you even understand it, but you're not listening with the intent to do anything about it, are you? Why? Or why not? Not my kid. All right? Same thing with God. He hears it. Not his child. No, not his child. Not gonna, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna listen with the intent to do anything, because that's not that's not my child. And so with that in so so we want to make sure, first of all, that we're we're talking about the same thing. So when we say God does not hear sinners, does not hear sinners, we're talking about sinners in the sense of people who are not Christians or are Christians who are living outside of that covenant relationship with God. Hearing means to listen with the intent to do something, not just the idea or the fact that God hears or knows that a thing is going on. So in that sense, we say God does not hear sinners. He does not hear the prayer of sinners. So now the next question that rose out of that answer was, and by the way, it came to me from a, a, a member of the church. He said, if God does not hear sinners, please explain Cornelius. So open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 10. Now, I'm going to say, I'm going to say something to you tonight that I have never said before. All right? I'm going to say something, but I'm not going to say it yet. I'm going to make you listen for a little bit. I'm going to build my case. But I had a discussion with a preacher friend of mine, and I cannot for the life of me remember who, I, who it was. It was a conversation by phone. A, a preacher friend of mine had called me, and we were talking about some things. In fact, I think, I think maybe he heard me preaching on uh, one of the PTP lectures or something like that, and he had some questions for me. Now, in Acts chapter 10, we read about Cornelius, beginning in verse 1. What does the Bible tell us about Cornelius? He was a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed to God always. All right, now, verse 3. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers... And your alms have come up for a memorial before God. All right? Cornelius is, obviously he's not a Christian, but also he's not a Jew. He's not a Jew, he's a Gentile. He's the first, he's the first person or head of a household of a purely Gentile nature to ever hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, thinking about Cornelius, we need to remember this. Does Cornelius fit, does Cornelius fit the description of sinner as we defined it in the common New Testament usage? No, he does not. He wasn't a Jew, but he also wasn't living outside of a, of a dedicated, uh, 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 determinated, or determinate, uh, attempt to live right before God. So no, the way we describe sinner, which I believe is correct, neither one of those fits Cornelius. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you before that I've, that I've never said out loud before because I've just only recently, and, and if you think I'm wrong, I, look, you can tell me you think I'm wrong and we can study it, all right? And I might be wrong and I may not explain it right. I don't believe Cornelius was lost before Peter got there. You think I'm right? All right. Kyle and John say I'm right. That settles it. <laughs> the first time he heard the gospel. He was living, he was living faithfully to the covenant that he was living under, which was the patriarchal covenant, right? The Bible says he feared God. 
He was a worshiper of God. He diligently tried to serve God with every fiber of his being. Doesn't mean he never sinned, but he was living faithful to the covenant that he had with God or that God had with him. Oh yeah, at that time, better off than his Jewish neighbors, right. Yeah. So, now let me back this up even one more step. Actually, two steps. One thing is that we have to understand, one thing we want to understand is, is that you have the law of patriarchy, and you have the law of Moses that are running, that are running concurrent. You know, before, before Sinai, it was all patriarchy. But then God, you know, God gave the, you know, God gave the Ten Commandments at, at Sinai, and the law of Moses kicks in. So the Jews are living under the law of Moses, but everybody that's a Gentile is still living under the patriarchal law. Until when? Technically. Until when? Okay, yeah. All right, let's just put it this way. Until the cross. Now. On the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, the gospel is preached for the first time to the Jews, right? Now, there's uh, approximately 50 days here in between the cross and the day of Pentecost. All right? Are there saved, are there Jews in this period of time that are saved? In this 50-day period, are there, are, there, are there still Jews that are saved during this 50-day period? Yeah. Are the apostles still saved? Are the 120 still saved? I, did, I, now, did, did, when the day of Pentecost came and the gospel was preached for the first time, did they become lost just because the day of Pentecost came? Or did they obey what they were told when they were told it. So in other words, they continued to be saved, but the moment that the gospel was preached and they responded to it, they just, they just left one covenant and entered into another, right? In other words, they didn't have to be lost to go from one covenant to the next. Does that make sense? Alright, so if this might be true for, if this is true for the Jews, then we're going to come out here and we're going to run our timeline out to Acts 10 and the household of Cornelius. Were there, were there Gentiles? And let's just say that this period is 10 years. I don't know how long it was. It might have been 8 years. might have been 10 years. I'm just going to throw 10 years out there. Were there Gentiles saved in this 10 year period between the cross and the household of Cornelius? Yes. Sure. Sure. The, yeah, but, but during this 10... But during, yeah. That's right. So, so during this 10 year period between the cross and the Gentiles hearing the gospel for the first time, Gent, there were Gentiles that could be saved too, right? As long as they continued living, well, living like Cornelius. So when Cornelius heard, when Cornelius heard and his household heard the gospel and they obeyed it, they did the same thing that the Jews did. They stepped out of one covenant into the next covenant. They didn't, in other words, they didn't have to become lost to leave one covenant and enter into the other covenant. And they didn't have to obey the law just to sit inside. That's right. There you go. The only way that they would have been lost was to have heard it and rejected it. Now, day of Pentecost, there were some Jews who heard it and then didn't obey it, right? We know 3,000 did obey it. 3,000 did obey it. But a bunch of them didn't. And the moment they heard the gospel and refused to obey it, what happened to them? They were they were lost even though they started to continue to practice Judaism because once the gospel was preached to them and the new covenant was preached to them, that's the covenant they were answerable to. They were no longer answerable to the, to the uh, law of Moses. 
That's right, it became of no effect to them. But the, the, by the way, the same thing would have continued. I mean, think about this. Yeah. Think about the Jewish people. Yeah. But th think about think about how many years it took to preach the gospel to every Jew on the planet. Might have taken fifteen or twenty years, right? Might have taken fifteen. But let's just say if it took fifteen or twenty years, that means that there were still some Jews that could be saved under the law of Moses. Even though the law of Christ had been preached, right? Until they heard the law of Christ, they were still answerable to the law that they were under. Alright? So that's why, that's why I think it's easier, I think it helps us to understand how Cornelius' prayers were heard. Because he was, a, he was a faithful servant of God. He wasn't a Jew, but he was a faithful servant of God. And so that's how, that's how we can explain that Cornelius uh, uh, was, not, uh, was not lost up until the point that he heard the gospel. He was still saved up until the point he heard the gospel. And then when he heard the gospel, what did he do? He obeyed. As a matter of fact, all of them there obeyed. They all obeyed. Which tells us not just about Cornelius, it tells us about everybody that was, you know, Cornelius said, We are all here to hear whatsoever things are commanded of you by God. In other words, we're here. Whatever God has to say to us through you, we're here to hear it. And when they heard it, they obeyed it. So there's the answer. First of all, there's the answer to how. What about Cornelius? How were how were his prayers heard? It's because he was still he was still in a faithful relationship with God um, uh, from from even from Pentecost up until <coughs> Acts chapter ten. So then, the next question comes in. The next question comes in. And if God doesn't hear sinners, and I, by the way, I have no idea who asked this question. It was, paid, it was, posted, in, uh, it was posted in my Instagram thread. Because I post all my videos on my Facebook page, <coughs> in Reels, in Stories, and on Instagram. All right? And it came in on Instagram, and the question was, if God does not hear sinners, how are they saved? Well, immediately, I'm thinking, this person believes what? The sinner's prayer. This person believes the doctrine of the sinner's prayer. And so I started doing some digging and, and, uh, and uh, studying and... and um, First and foremost, and, here, and here's how I dealt with it for when that question came in the, when, in, in the video. You can't find the sinner's prayer in the New Testament. You can't, find it in, you can't find it written down. You can't find it practiced. You can't even find it implied. So on that basis alone, the sinner's prayer has to be rejected as, as un, unbiblical. It's not only unbiblical, it's anti-biblical. Unbiblical means you can't find it in the Bible. Anti-biblical means it goes against what you can find in the Bible. So the sinner's prayer is both unbiblical and anti-biblical. Alright? So, I started digging around, and I had always heard this, but I wanted to do a little more digging. The origin of the sinner's prayer is only about a hundred years old. The origin of the sinner's prayer is only about a hundred years old. Uh, as, a, as, a general, as a general rule of understanding with regard to the history of the sinner's prayer, there are some who believe that D.L. Moody, if you've ever heard of the Moody Bible Institute, Moody uh, publishing company. I believe it's out of Chicago. Uh, it, it, uh, that D.L. Moody was the first to, to use the terminology and the practice of the sinner's prayer. He lived in the late 1800s and early 1900s. That was his scope of influence. All right. Associated with the sinner's prayer later became accepting Jesus as your personal Savior which also cannot be found in the New Testament, either in doctrine or practice or implication. 
There's nothing in the Bible that says anything about accepting Jesus into your heart, accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. But those two, but that, those two concepts became basically intertwined. The idea of accepting Jesus as your personal Savior and saying the sinner's prayer became basically one. The two things became, became one. And this idea of accepting Jesus as your personal Savior was made popular in the early 1900s by a radio preacher by the name of Billy Sunday. Now, Billy Sunday was a professional baseball player, well-known athlete, who had a conversion experience at the hand of D.L. Moody. And Sunday was so convicted by, by uh, what he believed to be his conversion that he gave up professional baseball and became a traveling and radio preacher. And Billy Sunday was really the, the, the instigator of putting these two things together. Accepting Jesus as your personal Savior and saying the sinner's prayer. Now, from... By the time, I think Sunday may have died in 1935, I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that. But about the time that Billy Sunday faded into the sunset, another Billy came on the scene. What Billy was that, John? Billy Graham. Billy Graham. And Billy Graham took accepting Jesus as your personal Savior and reciting the sinner's prayer, and he... Man, I mean, he made a, he made a worldwide he made a worldwide movement out of it, and so he carried that on. And of course, by the time Billy Sunday had preached it, a number of other preachers had embraced it. Uh, uh, it seemed like uh, there was another guy I was trying. I, I can't remember. I can't off the top of my head, but but uh, it be, they popularized it, and then preachers everywhere began to preach it. Preachers everywhere began to preach it. And there's a guy by the name of Bill, uh, Bill Bright who is the founder of what's called the Campus Crusade for Christ. And Bill Bright began to publish what he called the Four Spiritual Laws and the Sinner's Prayer and put it at the back of every track, every booklet, every book that he ever wrote. I had never heard of the four... Have any of y'all ever heard the phrase Four Spiritual Laws? I've never heard, until I started doing this research, I had never heard it, all right? But the four spiritual laws, by the way, the four spiritual laws, if understood correctly, and not by correctly, I mean in the biblical sense, they're all true. All right, listen to it. Here they are. God loves you and has a plan for your life. Number two, man is tainted by sin and sep thus separated from God. Spiritual law number three, Jesus is God's only provision for sin. Spiritual law number four. We must place our faith in Jesus in order to receive salvation. All four of those things are true. They all say that. Those, yeah, you, here's the thing. You've all seen the four spiritual laws. You just didn't know they were called that. Because they're in, like John said, they're in the back of every track, every booklet. And by the way, at the end of... The four spiritual laws is always sinner's prayer. You read that track, you'll notice that those those four laws are in bold. They're bright red or whatever. Bright red, bold, and black. That's right. That's right. And the sinner's prayer is found in a million different forms. A million different forms. But basically, the sinner's prayer is is supposed to be an acknowledgement of the four spiritual laws but it always concludes with please forgive me of my sins thank you for accepting me and giving me eternal life and that's about how every sinner's prayer ends now of course the Bible doesn't teach that the four spiritual laws are accurate provided they're understood properly Johnny Right. When it says, Are any of you sick? Are there any sick among you? Let them call the elders that they may pray over them. Mm -hmm. That pray, that prayer from the elders, for the most part, is intent that they hadn't sinned in life. 
That's exactly right. Not to heal them over sickness because if they died, lost. That's right. They're lost. That's exactly right. The, 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 prayer, the prayer in James 5, the prayer in James 5 was, was a prayer primarily for sin. It was a prayer for healing, but it was also a prayer for spiritual healing in the event that the person... That's right. That's right. Yeah, I guess that'd be right. There's just yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. That'd be right. That'd be right. That's where I that's where I take All right. So now getting back getting back to the origin of the sinner's prayer. There is there is an interesting there is an interesting um um account in and I'm going to say this right because I almost said it. I, I said it wrong to myself this morning. In John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, I almost called it Paul Bunyan's. It's John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress in the ninth, uh, uh, in the ninth stage, uh, chapter 18, a statement is made by one of the characters in Pilgrim's Progress that, that speaks about prayer in the sense of prayer being the means by which a person can be saved. But it, it's really more it's really more in a in a conversational, not as so much as a doctrinal statement. And by the way, Pilgrim's Progress is published in sixteen seventy eight. So but so far as the sinner's prayer as we know it, uh, it you can't trace the origin of the sinner's prayer back more than about 130, 140 years at best. You know, D. L. Moody, late eighteen hundreds, popularized by Billy Sunday in the early nineties. 1900s. So there's your origin of the sinner's prayer. By the way, um, um, I, I stumbled across this, but in a 2001 doctoral dissertation titled The Sinner's Prayer, A Historical and Theological Analysis, uh, uh, Paul Chitwood, who was, from the Southern, who was at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, wrote his doctoral dissertation on the origin of the sinner's prayer, and he said it can't be traced. And by the way, he's a Baptist, and he says you can't trace it back earlier than the early 20th century. In other words, the early, the early 1900s. I mean, I mean that's, that's a pretty serious document. I mean, that, I mean Southern Baptist Theological Seminary is a, I mean, it's a for real school. It's not, you know, it's not like some online fly-by-night group. I mean, there's serious Bible students there. In his dissertation, he said, you can't trace it back earlier than the early, uh, early 20th century. And so, uh, and so there's a, you know, the origin of it obviously uh, precludes it being in any way biblical. You know, Johnny Ramsey, if it's new, it isn't true. And if it's true, it isn't new. And by, by religious standards, the sinner's prayer is new. It's new. And uh, thus, uh, it's, it, is, it is not true. Now, let me jump ahead just a little bit. At the Southern Baptist Convention in New Orleans, at the New Orleans Theological Seminary in uh, 2012, there was a big debate among the Baptists over the sinner's prayer. And some of you may have heard of a preacher by the name of David Platt. I believe David Platt wrote the book Radical. It's a book on discipleship, and I've read a, a good bit of that book. And by the way, it is quite good. It is quite good. But Platt said, the sinner's prayer and accepting Jesus into your heart is, his words, superstitious and unbiblical. Superstitious and unbiblical. Now, that's what, that's what a well-known Baptist preacher and author said. Now, guess what happened when he said that in public? He didn't get fired, but all of his, all of his Baptist cohorts lost their ever-loving minds. And they just rained fire and brimstone on David Platt for saying that. And so you know what he did? He explained himself and basically said, well, I didn't mean what I obviously said which is what people do nowadays, right? You say something that's true and the woke mob loses their mind and then you apologize for saying something that's obviously true. Well, David Platt apologized for saying what is obviously true, that the sinner's prayer is both superstitious and unbiblical. But, uh, but 
I just simply tell you that, say that to mention or to let you know that there are a lot of people in the denominational world who do not, who do not accept, who do not accept the sinner's prayer. Now, here's what the official, here's what, here's the official statement, all right? This is the official statement from the Southern Baptist Convention. We affirm that repentance and faith involve crying out for mercy and calling on the Lord, Romans 10, 13, often identified as the sinner's prayer, as a biblical expression of repentance and faith. In other words, the sinner's prayer is not what a person says to be saved. It's something that a person says because they're already saved. Right. It's not something they say in order, so they, they, they've explained it in this way. It's not something you say to be saved, but people who say it are obviously saved people because if they weren't saved people, they wouldn't say it. Why is it called the sinner's prayer? That's a good question <laughs> that I can't answer. Because if you're already saved, you're uh, yes, I understand that. <laughs> I understand it. And you are 100% absolutely right. Uh, they, they shouldn't call it the used to be sinner's prayer. You know, shortly, you know, shortly a four time sinner's prayer. I, I don't know, but Rhonda's exactly right. It can't be the sinner's prayer if people who say it are saved. Yeah, and so, but they say that's an expression, that's an expression of being saved and really doesn't have anything to do with being saved. Now, in the time that we have left, I'm going to mention three, three passages. I want to mention three passages that are oftentimes offered up as a defense of the sinner's prayer. And two of them are, are the same words in two different texts, okay? But I want to start with the singular text. Open, if you would, to the book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse number 20. Revelation 3 and verse 20 is sometimes offered up as a text to defend the sinner's prayer. KD, are you there? Can you get there? You got it in the NIV. <laughs> well, go ahead and read it in the NIV. 320, Revelation 320. Alright, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will say, hear my, hear my voice. Say, hear my voice. Okay. Alright, John, give me the give me the give me the red letter apostle Paul version. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man what? Will hear my voice and open, open the door. I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Alright, so let's run backwards in our text just a little bit, okay? Just a little bit. What's verse 18 say? Oh, I'm sorry. I gave you the wrong verse. Hold on. I'm sorry. Verse 14. I'm sorry. Verse 14. Stop. Who's it written to? Christians. I mean, the whole book of Revelation is written to Christians, right? Not alien sinners. Not alien sinners. Written to Christians. I mean, you read Revelation 1, you read Revelation 2, you read Revelation 3, and you see that this book was written to the seven churches of Asia. This is a, you know, in other words, Jesus' statement about, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear me and open, I will come in. He's writing to Christians who have shut him out. 
Yeah. I'm rich and increased with goods, and I, you know, I don't have need of anything. And Jesus said, "You're you're, you're poor, wretched, blind, naked." Right? In other words, they they had a they had a they had a gross misunderstanding of their of their true spiritual of their true spiritual condition. And Jesus said, "You need to open up the door and let me come in." But he's writing to Christians. He's not writing or speaking to alien. I said writing. He's speaking to Christians, not to alien sinners. John obviously is the one who is writing. So Revelation three and verse twenty. To Christians. Now, the second text or texts, Acts 2.21 and the text mentioned in the Southern Baptist Statement, Romans 10.13. Doesn't matter which one you turn to, they both say the same thing. What's we'll say? Acts two twenty one. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So then the question is, well, isn't calling on the name of the Lord the same as the sinner's prayer? Look, it's a good question, right? It's a, it's a fair question. You know, calling on the name of the Lord is that the same as the sinner's prayer? Well. So what phrase do we what phrase do we have to define then? Calling on the name of the Lord. By the way, I found this text as I was doing this research, and I hadn't thought about it before. But look at First Corinthians chapter one and verse two. What's Paul say in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2? And I hope I got that right. That's off the top of my head. There it is. With all who in every place call on the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. So Paul's writing to the church. And he describes the church as people who have done what? Called on the name of the Lord, right? In other words, calling on the name of the Lord is calling on the name of the Lord is in Paul's eyes the means by which a person becomes a Christian. Right? He said that those that are sanctified. Yeah, but but those two phrases are they're connected. Those that are sanctified and call on the name of the Lord, that's the same group of people. Alright? And so in that sense, those that are thinking that the sinner's prayer is calling on the name of the Lord's by the means by which a person comes a Christian, we're, on, we're still thinking the same thing. But we still haven't defined it, have we? So, Acts 2.21 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, in Acts chapter 2, and beginning in about verse 36, Peter makes the statement after, after preaching Jesus, first of all, after identifying the events of that day as the fulfillment of Joel 2, he says, you killed Jesus and He's been raised from the dead. He says, and we're all witnesses of it. We're witnesses of the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead. He says, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That's verse 36. When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What were they, what were they asking when they said, What shall we do? How do we get this off of us? In other, in other words, were they asking how to be saved? They were asking how to be. In other words, how can we be saved from from what you have told us we're guilty of? How can we be saved from that? If Acts two twenty one says whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, and they want to know how they need to be saved, are they not really asking how can we call on the name of the Lord in order to be saved? 
So what did Peter so, so what did Peter tell him? Verse thirty eight. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You know, so it only makes sense that if whoever's going to call on the name of the Lord is going to be saved, that when Peter told them how to be saved, that would be the equivalent of calling on the name of the Lord. So Acts 2.38 tells us that to call on the name of the Lord is to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. But then in Romans 10, turn there real quick. I know I'm running out of time. I haven't changed the clock back since it's almost 7.30. In Romans 10 and verse 13, Paul says the exact same thing. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He says, but how shall they call on Him whom they've not what? Believe. believed? And how they believe on Him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And Paul says, you know, speaks, you know, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach, uh, bring glad tidings and preach the gospel of peace. But then look at verse 16. What's Paul say? But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Boom. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. So Paul equates obeying the gospel in verse 16 with calling on the name of the Lord in verse 13. Right? So calling on the name of the Lord in Acts 2 and 21 means to repent and be baptized according to verse 38. And in Romans 10, 13, it means to obey the gospel according to verse 16. Jesus said we've got to hear the gospel and be baptized in order to be saved, Mark 16, 15 and 16. So baptism is a part of obeying the gospel. But the clear-cut passage on how to call on the name of the Lord is Acts 22, 16. Paul, Paul recounted his own conversion. And he told those people, he was on trial when he said this, and he told those people exactly what he was told in order to have his sins remitted. What did Ananias tell him? He says, and now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and do what? Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. Acts 22, 16. Ties the whole thing together. It is, it is an express explanation of what it means to call on the name of the Lord. To be baptized and wash away your sins. To obey the gospel. To repent and be baptized for the remission of of sin. So Acts 2.21, Romans 10.13 do not teach the sinner's prayer. In fact, they teach, the, it, they teach the very thing that those who believe the sinner's prayer deny. And Acts 22.16 is, again, is the, is the linchpin, uh, linchpin uh, to what it means to call on the name of the Lord. Alright, my time is gone. Any questions or comments or smart remarks? what one of my professors used to say at Freed Harbor all the time. Questions, comments, or smart remarks? Okay. All right, so, so we'll follow. Oh, no, I don't have time to do Romans 10, 9 tonight, but I will. We'll pick that up, Lord willing, next Sunday night. Don't let me forget that, Philip. And I'll tell you what, I'll write it down here. And I'll let you show me Romans 10, 9, and it's also going to go to Romans 10.10. Uh, 10. Those two passages cannot be... Romans 10.9 and Romans 10.10 10 cannot be separated uh, from one another. All right? But also, what, an interesting idea is we're, we've already been, we're already in Romans 10, right? So whatever we find in Romans 10.9 and 10 has to go with Romans 10.13, which has to go with Romans 10.16. All right, so that's where we'll pick up, Lord willing, next week. And I have questions about the Sabbath, uh, the institution of the Sabbath. And so uh, I should be able to get, provided I don't get any additional questions between now and then, I should be able to deal with this question and then move on uh, to questions with regard to the Sabbath uh, uh, next uh, Sunday evening. Good to see everybody tonight. Appreciate everybody's attendance, your attention, your participation.
Uh, it's good to be back in this format. Good to know that people are watching and asking questions. That's what it's all about. We're, we're thankful, thankful for that. So uh, if we don't have anything else, I'm going to turn the camera off. Ask you if you would uh, be on your feet.